Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear viewers on the live stream, it's good to see a full house here. Please allow me to welcome His Excellency, the Prime Minister of the Slovak Republic, Edward Heger. Welcome. I don't welcome anybody else here. Maybe Werner Fastelabend will do that after me. <laughs> um, because there are so many of who should be welcomed. Uh, it is a clear sign that neighborhood is important. Uh, and this neighborhood includes also, and I make one exception, I have to admit, I have to make one exception if, if, if you allow me. I would love to welcome the Ukrainian ambassador to Austria. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, in preparation of my words of welcome, I, as we do nowadays, I checked artificial intelligence, this time Microsoft, uh, and I asked what is the distance between Bratislava and Vienna. Uh, and this was an easy question. They, they told me it's 55 kilometers. Uh, and that means that it is really the closest between two capital cities in the European Union. And that means something. Geography counts. But then I became overconfident uh, and a bit cheeky. I asked uh, the artificial intelligence whether the Prime Minister Edward Heger is a pro European politician. And you know what the artificial intelligence <laughs> answered? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, it was not surprising. They said, We don't know, we don't have enough information. That's what you. <laughs> That's what Microsoft tells me. But Prime Minister, from what I know about your work and your positions, you have a very clear position, a very clear pro-European Western position. Uh, and I think 
especially your clear position on the war, the Russian war of aggression, uh, is something we, we highly appreciate also in this country. And uh, it's not only because you are immediate neighbor, it's because you are Central European and European as a country. And, and I, I do know that Slovakia is, is, is one of those countries where Central European means a lot because we experienced difficult times also with your neighbors, among others Austria, but this is a long time ago. Uh, and at the same time, we have this common experience that we now have to tell our Austrian citizens again uh, that parts of what is Ukraine today belong to the same political territory as Slovakia, as uh, Lower Austria, as, as the Western Ukraine. Uh, so it is good that we are talking about neighborhood. And I appreciate much that your title will not only talk about European visions, but also about good, good neighborhood in your, in your title. Uh, and, uh, well, if I may, I, let me allow also to congratulate you, congratulate you that you sent some MiG airplanes uh, to, to Ukraine. Uh, he said, the Ukrainian ambassador said something, but I didn't understand him correctly. <laughs> uh, so even in a neutral country, you get support when you say that we need to support Ukraine militarily also. Uh, uh, and on a personal note, I follow and much appreciate your commitment to European values and to, to Western values. Uh, I do understand that it's not always easy in politics to follow the course, especially when there are difficult times, elections are coming up and, and things like that. But uh, uh, you certainly do this. Uh, and you certainly have a friend here in Austria and your efforts uh, to bring together a reliable uh, and consistent government also uh, in, in your country in the future, in this year, actually. Uh, we all need this because we're all talking about the war in Ukraine, but uh, we should talk a little bit more about the future of Europe and the European integration. We had a conference on the future of Europe, and not much is being discussed of the outcomes of this conference of the future of Europe. We hear a French president talking about strategic autonomy, but we're not sure whether anybody is listening in Europe and what he really means by strategic autonomy. Uh, and uh, I think you and your country uh, can combine forces with other smaller countries on this continent, and they are all in Central and Eastern Europe, to formulate also ideas for the uh, for the future of Europe, uh, and it's uh, one of maybe one of the big issues that brought us this war was that we Europeans left too much decision making on the Western Europeans, uh, and so I plead also for a cooperation of the smaller Central European countries uh, to make this happen. But this goes already beyond the words of welcome. I'm just happy that you are here for the first time in the Vienna School, the Vienna School of International Studies, where we always appreciate uh, to uh, have students also from your country here. Uh, and uh, we hope that we can even get more of the students of your country. Uh, I'm happy also that you are here with your wife. Welcome, Ms. Hegerova. I am happy that we have the governor here of the region of Bratislava, uh, but and with his wife, also, welcome. <laughs> uh, but what I really want to say, you should feel at home at this place. This is also your academy of your people, and you can see by the full house here that this is something that we, that we all see the same way. Uh, and uh, I think that um, if we really believe in what we stand for here in this region, uh, we have a very good chance, and we all know that the solidarity of Europe is difficult sometimes, uh, and you have to find majorities in your country, the same holds true in other countries, uh, but there, there will be, a, 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 I think, a pro-European majority working on these sort of, of issues that you are so much involved in. But 
it is your task to give us Slovakia's vision for Europe. But before I give the word to you, I would love to have Werner Fasselabend uh, give his introduction, because this is an evening also of the Slovak Austrian uh, society, uh, and they are very active also in promoting the neighbor, the good neighborhood that we need here. So welcome again, Mr. Prime Minister. Okay. Um, Ambassador Briggs, thank you very much for your welcome. Dear Mr. Prime Minister, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. We started with a piece of music by Veronika Vitsakova, and she is a well-known flutist and uh, soloist and also orchestral uh, musician, not only in Slovakia, but also uh, in Austria, and of course also in other countries. And this is the best example, that there are so many things we do have in together. Austria and Slovakia certainly are two countries of music. And it's not only music that will combine us. I just wanted uh, to thank you for your coming. Before I do that, I also uh, want to express it that I will do it, not only personally, but also in, in the name of the whole Austria, Austro-Slovak uh, Association, Ambassador uh, Max Bama, uh, the Secretary General uh, Elena penzi strober and of course also our Vice President Josef Wurtic. And I also do it in the name of the great Slovak Ambassador Peter Mischik and his team, because they are backing us not only when there is such an event, but all the time. Thank you so much. And I just wanted... <laughs> just let me say a few words of welcome also uh, in your native language. Trica Drokov, Nesavisle Slovenske Republiki. Trica Drokov, Samostatne Slovensko Rakuske Spoločnosti. Važeni pan premier, srdečne vas vitam vo Viedni, a takajem vam sa vašu ochotu sučasnik sa na njeznom podujati. Težime sa na prejav. <laughs> We also are really happy that it has become and will become, uh, well, the celebration of uh, a family. And therefore, I also would like to ask Ambassador Pama uh, well, uh, to give a few flowers to Lady Hegarova. As Ambassador Briggs uh, said already and expressed already, you know, uh, Jure Dobre, it's a great pleasure. I mean, he's well known in the whole uh, region between uh, Slovakia and Austria, of course. Uh, and he's only one part of the Slovak delegation that came today. It's also Miroslav Vlachowski, uh, the, the advisor for foreign policy for the prime minister and also Dominik Bovacnik, the director of his office. Great pleasure that you are here. I also want uh, to greet the ladies. And of course, also the Austrian side, uh, ambassadors. Just one example in the first row that I can see. Uh, our M ambassador that used to be a member of uh, the lower Austrian government just until a few days ago, and now is responsible for not only neighborhood policy, but also for the whole uh, Danube region. Please greet, together with me, uh, also Martin, uh, uh, Martin Eichtinger. Yeah. 
together with him, of course, I want to greet Thomas Oberreitner, political director, and of course also our ambassador in Bratislava, uh, Margit uh, Bruck Friedrich. Heartily welcome to all of you. I have a long list of ambassadors. Uh, I just want, I, I do not want to mention them, of course, personally, but I can say the whole neighborhood has come. Uh, not only Czech Republic and Hungary, he has become sick, Ukraine, of course, uh, the Austrian side, but also Romania, Moldova, uh, Slovenia, uh, Albania, Cyprus, uh, many countries also outside, Belgium, the Netherlands, France especially. Yeah. This is a, a really great pleasure. But also neighbors from Lithuania, uh, ambassadors from Lithuania, from Armenia, and also from other countries outside Europe. I do not see everybody and therefore I do not greet them personally now, but I can tell you that we have diplomats here from the whole five continents and around about 30 countries uh, that wanted to come and listen to you, Mr. Prime Minister. Yeah, uh, what is the reason? Why is, this, is it so important? It certainly is so important because, as a matter of fact, Slovakia is Austria's closest neighbor. Ambassador Briggs mentioned it already. And it's not only the fact that it's not only the closest capitals in the European Union, but worldwide, except Congo, Brazzaville, and Kinshasa. Otherwise, we are the closest. And this means, of course, also uh, that we had not only, uh, or that we do not have only a common geography. It's quite fascinating, you know, uh, when you see that, yeah, Vienna is at the western end of the Alps, and Bratislava is at the eastern, uh, vice versa, at the western end of the Carpathian regions. And insofar, the two big central European mountain chains they are meeting here, and they are meeting at the same time with the Danube loop. And this made this place always, whether this is uh, Vienna or Bratislava or even already in the Roman period, Canuntum, more or less a central strategic point for the whole continent. And this is also the reason that uh, already now you can see, you know, that Vienna and uh, Bratislava are not very close to each other, but they are coming closer every day. 10,000 people are moving every day from the one city into the other city. They are moving, uh, they are buying houses, they are living together, they are marrying, and so on. And what we can see here now probably is more or less that a new metropolitan area for Central, for central Europe is generating here. This is certainly some development we should not overlook for the future. And of course, we also do have a common past. When we are in this building, you know, this was uh, originally an imperial palace. Uh, Emperor Charles VI died over here in this palace and his daughter, Maria Theresia, overtook it and made two academies out of it. She is more or less the historic Landesmutter, not only for Austria, but also for Slovakia and many others. And insofar, we do have a common past. 400 years we were under the same rule of, uh, within the Habsburg Empire. And now we are at the same time members of not only European Union, but so many institutions. And this is, of course, a challenge because we have to create our own fate and we have to create it in common. And this is why we have invited and we are really proud and want to thank you that you give us the honor and the pleasure to come here and to speak. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you so much for your coming. 
Thank you so much for being ready to make a speech. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Schönen Abend, dobry večer, good evening. Uh, es ist mir eine Freude, hier heute zu sprechen und vielen Dank für die Einladung. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, well, once again, thank you very much for being able to speak here to you and then uh, looking forward to the discussion. And uh, first of all, I want to appreciate the atmosphere. I really, when I came, they told me, uh, feel like at home. And you said it also, uh, and well, thank you, you said it uh, as, uh, as the beginning words. And I can, really under, I can really feel the great atmosphere of friendship, of, of family uh, on, this, on this floor, on this ground, and, uh, and it's so important. In the beginning, you could hear the words from Mr. Briggs where uh, he said, it's important, uh, the neighborhood is important. Well, I would even go further, and I would say, uh, it all starts with neighborhood. We want to speak of our vision, and we want to speak of the vision within Europe, which is a rich continent of many countries, many nations. Uh, it all starts with neighborhood. Because it all depends what kind of relationship you have in the neighborhoods. It influences the whole atmosphere in the whole Europe. And I will speak uh, about it over these last three years. Because... Uh, there's two areas I would like to touch. One is the vision of Europe, and the second is the vision of good neighborhood. But I will start with the vision of good neighborhood, and I would like to put it on the, on the fact of the relationship between Slovakia and Austria as a, as a beginning. And as, that's why I'm so glad that Juraj Droba, uh, not only my good colleague uh, in, in, uh, in the uh, government uh, partner for Bratislava region, but also a very good friend, and I would say he's to me like a brother. Uh, we've known each other for over 20 years, and I'm so glad we are here together, and, and we can... Uh, show the, the respect toward you and thankfulness for, for all what we went through uh, together as, as countries, as nations, even in the long history, as it was mentioned. Well, Slovakia started uh, its journey 30 years ago as an independent Slovak Republic. And uh, ever since, I think we, well, even from this period, we had very good relationships. And our government started uh, in 20, on 21st of March 2020. And it was at the beginning of the COVID crisis. And the reason why I'm mentioning, especially this, this uh, time, it's because uh, over these three years we went through so many crises and Austria has been always a good neighbor. I remember during the COVID, uh, Slovakia as a country going through a lot of, uh, I would say, Russian propaganda, but also a lot of fear of, of uh, different measures uh, and uh, vaccinations, etc. We very much uh, welcomed the help when we were going through a big testing in Slovakia where you provided your soldiers to, to help us with this testing, but you also provided us free hospital beds, even though you didn't have enough uh, to share, but you, you showed the... the the hospitality you showed you know, that uh, we are we are good neighbor to you and i want to thank you for that and we could go further in the history uh, of of our countries where we helped each other and this just shows how important a good relationship uh, to have and that we had them well even when we go to the velvet revolution austria as a as a direct member and i remember as a, as a child i was 13 years old back then and the iron uh, the curtain uh, the Iron Curtain uh, fell down and we could travel and we were all wanted to see how, how the developed world looks like. And we would come here to look into your stores and we flooded your streets. But uh, it was very important that you also were one of the countries who came to Slovakia and invested. And uh, our relationship is also measured by the trade we have together, by the investments. And, and Austria is the third uh, most important investor uh, in Slovakia with over 7 billion euros, uh, which is great. And, and you have uh, uh, the banking sector, uh, insurance sector, and uh, also grocery sector. And I would say uh, I could go through other companies who are, who are present in Slovakia 
and, and we are thankful for having such a good uh, relationship. Our, also, our labor markets are kind of melted at, uh, at this moment, and also the uh, academy, uh, as you mentioned, uh, many students come to study, which is very good. We're always glad when you send them back after they study so uh, they can apply what they learned in Slovakia. <laughs> and uh, that's a great challenge for us. And as a prime minister who started uh, during the recovery plan in Slovakia, many reforms, education reform is one of the uh, very important ones. And then, as I say in Slovakia, if we want to have a, a successful nation, it must be healthy and it must be educated. So these are the two priorities of my government, and, and uh, I'm very thankful we have a great cooperation uh, in this respect as well. Uh, our good relationship is also visible, when I speak of, of URI, through uh, the regional cooperation. And I'm so thankful we have many projects uh, in the infrastructure, even, I would say, in the countryside. You know, somebody must say, why are we investing into the countryside? Well, it's so important uh, through the river building bridges, because bridges connect people, but we have bridges for, for bicycles, bridges for cars, but we also have a lot of heritage, and we invest into uh, this heritage together. We're doing a, together uh, the book of history, of our common history, which is great when the historians speak together about the history. It's, uh, sometimes the historians are like the lawyers, you know, they, they always have their own view, so it's important when they speak together and when they put it uh, into the record and, and uh, it always uh, brings us uh, closer and closer to, uh, together. And when, the, uh, when the Danube was mentioned, uh, maybe you know or not, uh, I, even when uh, Sebastian Kurz was uh, the chancellor, we started this, uh, this initiative, which is uh, uh, Innovation Danube Valley, and we're cooperating in this respect because we think that as good neighbors we have uh, many many to uh, give and uh, we want to learn from, from Austria but also together invest. Slovakia is investing into innovations over 600 million euros uh, from the recovery plan and it's good if we do it could do, uh, together uh, also in the format of S3 and uh, with Czech Republic and others but the, the Danube Valley is I think it's a great project uh, to, to develop. We chose on different levels not just regional but also countries how important it is to uh, cooperate. Well, this is uh, the neighborhood that we have together between Slovakia and Austria. But of course, neighborhood for Slovakia, who is now uh, presiding the, the heading, uh, the uh, format S3, as I said, Czech Republic, Austria, and Slovakia, but also the V4. Uh, it's important to build the good relationship with all the neighbors. And here I would like to speak about Ukraine for a moment, but also uh, with respect to Ukraine, I must say that having uh, neighbors, it doesn't necessarily, good relationship with neighbors, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have all together the same opinion on everything. In a communism regime, they taught us to have the same opinion. Everybody had to have the same opinion on, on all the issues. Well, we know now this is not the right way, and I want to start uh, or uh, speak a little bit about the values. Because the time we live, now, we live now, it brings us back to the values of democracy, it brings us back to the value of freedom, it brings us back to the value of human rights, and it brings us back to the value of rule of law. All these four values we see we cannot take for granted. In 21st century, in developed Europe, you would think this is given. We don't have to worry. We just have to work on the quality of life and uh, where do we go for vacation, whether it's going to be Africa, Asia, uh, uh, America, etc. But with the Russian aggression, with the Russian war in Ukraine, as a and I'm speaking as a Slovak, Slovak prime minister, but also as a Slovak citizen's direct member, you realize from overnight, I remember that morning of 24th of February, where my minister of defense called me, it started, it's there. We're seeing and we saw how the Russian troops were coming to the borders of Ukraine in hundreds of thousands. Everybody saw it, the halt, but nobody wanted to admit that it could actually happen. We all thought it's just threatening, threatening, threatening. And then they just came in, 
like a knife into, into a butter. And we saw how cruelly they attacked Ukraine. It wasn't just a border, border attack. It was actually a, a waste attack on the whole country. And there you realize that they crossed all the treaties. The rule of law was no more effective. Human rights, with all the criminal acts that we see what they do during this war to Ukrainians, you see human rights, they are not guaranteed at all. Speaking of our neighbor. Freedom, no guarantee of freedom. And democracy, they don't care. Russia doesn't care that Ukraine was a democratic country. And I speak as a country who is right next to Ukraine, because we have a, a, a battlefield in Slovakia now. There is, uh, as I said, Russian propaganda very present in Slovakia. It's starting during COVID, where many people, only half of our population get vaccinated. The rest of the uh, population didn't get vaccinated because there was so many disinformation present and it was built up on, on the same platform as the, uh, now there's a lot of disinformation about the Russian aggression and Russian war in Ukraine. And many people died because of that. I have a friend, I had a friend, a father of four ch children who died because he didn't get vaccinated and he was in my age and he died of COVID. So uh, we see that uh, Ukraine being so severely attacked. Now, there is a question and debate whether we should have a neighbor of free, democratic and developed Ukraine or whether they should give up their freedom, give up their territory, and Russia will be our neighbor. They will be on our border. That totally changed the whole perspective. Within a couple weeks, days, months, it totally changed the whole perspective. The whole issue of security within Europe changes when Russia is at our eastern border of Slovakia or it's where it should be on the eastern side of Ukraine because Ukraine should have its territory. And Ukraine is a great example for us how we should treat our own values. Because the first lesson learned from this that we traded our values. We traded our values for cheap gas and oil. Well, we see that there is no guarantee that Russian oil and gas is cheap because it's not anymore. And we learned the lesson in the summer of 21 when Vladimir Putin decided not to provide enough gas into our storages and started to play with the price of gas and caused this whole energy crisis. It was his strategy to weaken Europe together with uh, disinformation and pro propaganda, together with threatening with nuclear weapons, etc., etc., and also with attacking Ukraine in such a severe uh, way. Well, the Ukrainians, on the other hand, show us very strongly how to respond to Russia and how to respond in defense of our own values. Well, we learned the lesson that we should never trade our values for comfort, even if it's a comfort of uh, uh, so-called, as I said, cheap gas and oil, but because also it could cost you your lives, lives of your citizens. And I remember when Volodymyr Zelensky had a speech to our parliament in Slovakia, uh, he wasn't present because he started to travel just recently, as you know. But uh, this was half a year ago uh, uh, in the parliament on, on the screen. And he said, please, don't do the same mistakes uh, as we did. We also traded our values for cheap gas and oil from Russia. And now we're paying with our lives for it. So, so they stood against it. But what it cost in Europe was very interesting to see. And now I will stop for a moment with naming all those crises we went through over the last three years. In the last decade, or even more, we went through crisis of, of uh, financial crisis. This was a big event in the world, and it was only one crisis. It was a rather longer crisis. It started 2008, uh, was ongoing till 2011, 
It was with the experience we have now over the last three years, it was easy to accommodate. It was easy to work with. But then we had migration crisis, which is still not over, and we ha I will speak about it for a moment. Then Brexit, and in between, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Russians took Crimea, and that's where we were still too blind. We didn't see it coming. Now we know that that was still the same Vladimir Putin. He just was, uh, he was just uh, increasing the, the pressure and was testing the resistance of Europe. And we were sleeping and sleeping and sleeping. Finally, we woke up and uh, COVID uh, migration from Ukraine and also from, from other parts of the world, the energy crisis and the war, all these four crises, high inflation, very high inflation, five crises together uh, within three years. It's such a shock to every citizens or citizen of Europe that we realize the world is not going to be the same as it was uh, before 2020. And that's why it's so important to speak about the future of Europe. We had some vision, but the vision totally changed. We have to go back to our roots. We have to go back to our values and we have to understand uh, what it means to live these values every day. And I speak of it again as a country uh, where it's part of NATO with uh, very low uh, expenses on our defense in the previous years. My government started to spend and we had the goal to 2% of GDP and we said we want to be uh, faithful to it, so we're increasing, increasing, and this year we will we'll make it. Last year we were very close to it. But we realized on the 24th of February 2022 that the only protection we had was this when we saw that Russia attacked Ukraine, our direct neighbor, that we had this shield where it was written NATO. Because our tanks were so obsolete, they wouldn't be able to, to really cope with uh, such attack. Uh, our air force was down, our mix were already down because the previous government decided we're going to buy F-16s, but we're, they weren't delivered yet. We didn't have enough pilots for the mix, etc. So uh, air defense, old S-300 system, never tested, never used. So this is how you appear as a neighboring country of this severe attack, and you realize the only fact you have that you have allies within NATO. And there... Within weeks, the allies come to you and they say, we want to send our troops and our equipment to your country to protect you. They themselves, it's not that we ask them, please come help. They themselves see we are in trouble and they help us, just like you helped us during COVID. Uh, countries like Germany, Netherlands, United States, and also Poland, Slovenia, etc. brought their troops, brought their uh, state-of-art uh, air defense patriots, and our citizens overnight, within a couple of weeks, went from very low and uh, minimum uh, protection of, of their security to the highest level possible, which we would not be able to afford. We, if we would procure it, it would take years. If we would want to save money for it, it would take decades. So this is what the, uh, the, the, the being a member of, of such a strong alliance makes in a situation like this. They come immediately to help. And uh, when we speak of the vision, so we have to realize it's all, first, it's all about security. A lot of, many years we're speaking about economic growth. Now we realize the security is the number one issue. Because if you want to keep your country as a democratic, free country respecting rule of law, justice and human rights, you must have to guarantee the security for your own country. That's why security became, I would say, number one issue at the European Council about the, the member countries. And you see all the countries now speaking about they will be spending 2% GDP as a minimum. There's going to be a lot of development and a lot of workplaces in the industry of uh, security and, and uh, uh, weapon production. But uh, this uh, is the, the number one issue. The second uh, important issue that we have to learn is, and it goes back to the neighborhood and the good relationships. What happened at the European Council 
such a unity I haven't seen and growing unity I haven't seen when I was watching the, uh, the European uh, politics in the last decades. The sanction packages, I remember when we were uh, in May of 2021, we were deciding on the sanction package toward Belarus. And it was quite difficult. Many countries felt the discomfort. But with the sanction packages toward Russia, and when we were at the number four, we felt like this is the maximum we could go. Now we are at the number 10. And the reason why it was possible, because we saw how, how bravely uh, the Ukrainians fight for our values, for our protection, and we realized that we have to stop Russia at the eastern side of the uh, of their border uh, in Ukraine. So that's why we're helping also military-wise, that's why we help humanitarian-wise, that's why we did the sanctions, because we want Europe to be a peaceful continent, and we don't want the, the war come any closer. So security, unity, it's very important in, uh, in Europe, but also we s look at our challenges we have. And here I would like to speak a uh, little bit about uh, the enlargement of European Union. This also brought a new perspective, because we see that if we don't have good relationship, not just within European Union, but also with the countries around us, somebody else will have good relationship with them, and not European countries. What's the best for your security if I say the priority number one is the security? Well, one of the, uh, issue, one of the issues related to your security is how good relationship you do you have with your neighbors and whether you have better relationship with them than the others. That's why it's so important speaking so openly with the countries of, of uh, Western Balkans. And we saw a move, and they appreciate that we started to understand that this is not only about economic welfare. It's not only about new investments, but it's also the issue of security. And we could be a role model, and we are a role model of, uh, of, uh, to the whole world of this whole enlargement. So that's why one thing we have to understand is we should not have fear. We should not be afraid. We must be courageous. We must be brave, because only with this attitude, we can have a better future. Otherwise, we'll be the victim of our future given by somebody else. But we must be the leaders of our futures. We must be the creator, creators of our future. And that goes also with the Western Balkans. To, to it, it's related to migration. We saw that during even uh, this time, we had stronger migration coming from the southeast. Well, Schengen, it's a great uh, invention we have with the European Union, and it was tested. It was tested strongly. We had, uh, you know, we had border patrol between Czech Republic and Slovakia, also Austria and Slovakia, Austria and Slovenia, Austria, Hungary, and I could go on, Czech Republic, Germany, etc., etc., Austria, Germany. And you see that, uh, well, political pressure is something that you have to work with, uh, short term, but long term, you have to invest into the instruments you have. And Schengen, the outer border protection, that's the key. New, modern equipment, it's the key. Inspections and all of the, what we have within the Schengen rules must be obeyed. O only this way we can achieve the sex success together and a safer place in Europe. And we have to start to take care of uh, the, the countries where the migration starts. It's a great challenge. We have to come up with the idea how to do it as a continent of, of so many countries, how to find the unity. But it's possible. Single market is something which is, which is great and we have to build on it and we have to be very careful because this crisis, and I think we managed well, this crisis showed that even the level playing field has been tested because each country has different set of their uh, structure of the economy. They needed different help. And I remember during the COVID where Austria with the strong tourism, was saying, well, we need much more aid for the companies with the tourism. We're in Slovakia, strong industry. 
we need much more aid for the companies in industry. So, so, but the solidarity and the help is uh, very important. And of course, the infrastructure and the energies, as I mentioned, and also the challenge with the climate change is something that we uh, have to have strongly in mind with building the future and the vision on Europe. I don't want to, I, I will like to finish here because we will have we want to have some time for also for the for the questions but on all these examples I wanted to show you how important it is whenever we speak of our vision of our future we always have to have in mind our values and we have to realize that now is a great time to speak of our vision of our future because we are on a crossroads with so many crises, we know that every crisis is an opportunity for a better future. It always, it, the crises come and they mix up everything. But in this mess that the crises create, you tend to understand what are the priorities, what is the important, what is the importance. And the importance is based on good relationships. And I finish where I started. Good neighborhood is all where it starts. And good neighborhoods is about people. It's not about politicians. It's about people. <laughs> you know, we politicians, we come and go. And uh, the, the atmosphere in the country, uh, always the, the politicians all for certain times set certain priority of what the country is uh, doing. But the citizens are the ones who keep uh, the, the stability of those countries. And if our citizens understand the values of democracy, of freedom, of rule of law, of human rights, and demand it because they understand this is the essential, essential uh, attribute of a healthy society, then we are safe. And I'm sure that our European uh, citizens are aware of it. They've been tested in the last few years. They will be tested for a couple more years because there's a lot of elections coming in the countries. And we know that uh, Vladimir Putin doesn't like that the European countries support Ukraine because it makes him weaker. And he knows that he doesn't have enough weapons to conquer Ukraine. So he must do it with messing with, uh, with the elections, as we see also in uh, Slovakia, through all kinds of uh, propaganda. So I just count on our citizens who will be strong and will follow and will look up to the Ukrainian citizens who are so brave. That the One example I want to tell you. When uh, the, the war started, many mothers with children would come from Ukraine to Slovakia. I was coming to the border every second day because we had to set up all things going so the people don't freeze there, etc. And I could see the cry in the eyes of the children and the mothers and, and some of the children didn't have the shoes because they packed so quickly they just ran. But what we saw, many men were coming the opposite way, Ukrainian men. They were coming from the Western countries back to Ukraine to fight for their freedom. Can you imagine these men having a life, comfortable life in developed countries of Europe? said, I'm giving up my uh, good comfort I have, and I go back to my country with the perspective I will die in the war. When they did a test in Slovakia, a survey, how many people in Slovakia would do the same? 13% said, 13 said, we'll fight for Slovakia. 30 said, we'll surrender. And 30 said, we would flee. That's why I said it's good to look to Ukrainian bravery and this is the way we have to keep democracy in, in Europe. And if we keep the good relationships, I'm sure we will be the strongest continent in the world. We will be the role model for every other continent with so many countries, with so many traditions, with so uh, complex history we have here in Europe. But we are the answer to this world. And it starts with good neighborhood. Thank you very much.
Bitte. Yeah, Mr. Prime Minister, thank you so much for not only your speech, but the really very clear words. And what you said, this reminds me a little bit, you know, 30 years ago when Slovakia became an independent country, this was more or less the realization of a dream that had existed more than 1,000 years. Slovak nation to become not only an independent state, but self-ruling, self-governing, just making your own business yourself. And I admired this from the beginning. And this reminds me a little bit when you talked about Ukraine at the moment. Of course, Ukraine does have the right also, not only for independence, for self-governing, there must not be any chance for any invader. Thank you so much for the clear words and also that you pronounced so much uh, the importance of security. Uh, yeah, we do have a pretty young prime minister, you know. Uh, he studied in Bratislava economy. He worked in private business in different functions and only uh, 2016, he became a member of parliament and then he became finance minister. He had to overtake even the Ministry of, uh, for Health for a very short period because COVID was not over yet. And then you became prime minister. And therefore, I wanted uh, to ask yourself first question. You were in private business, you have quite some experience. You were finance minister, also involved in European affairs, uh, European bank and so on. How do you see now this situation? COVID is over. But on the other hand, we still have the security question and we also have inflation all over Europe. Uh, and we have uh, perspectives that maybe the a period of cheap energy will be over, more or less. How do you see this situation? Well, uh, as I said, I think it's, it's uh, challenging on one hand, but on the other hand, it brings a lot of opportunity. In, in all the areas, first of all, the room for hope. And I apologize, I speak so much about the values, but this really... We, we, with the comfort life we have in Europe and in Austria is have one of the highest, sometimes then we start to take the things for granted, sometimes then we start to uh, look only for our own comfort. But as you said, the, the, the neighborhood is about, and it's whether it's neighborhood with your neighbor in, in your house or with your country, it's about human relationships. And uh, when we got into this so many crises, many people in Slovakia started to be like frustrated. But then some of the voices started to say, every crisis is an opportunity, which, is the, which gives you the light at the end of the tunnel. So that's why I think we see some of the things w that we put a priority on and focus on, who now we see are no more needed. And some things we haven't seen was the uh, energies and we have to put the highest priority on. And it brings us not only changing the, the sources of the energy, but also, uh, I mean, of the fossil that we're not going to take it from Russia and, and uh, uh, Russia, I mean, oil and, and uh, gas. And now we're taking LNG, etc. But we have to have in mind in the, the climate change, I didn't have so much time to speak on it, but this is another value that we have to think how, what kind of world we want to live for the next generations. And I see that in the crisis, you tend to give up on your ambitions. You cannot do that. We have to do it at the same time. But with all these challenges, uh, it's, it's great. The unity that I saw among the leaders, 
Now, when they ask me, like, so what, what we were discussing, why, you, why is it so that we can decide so quickly as a European Union about the things? And I said, there's only one answer to it. Because now we have a real need. Before, we didn't have that much need. The only need was that let's improve. It's good to improve. But we didn't know why to improve. Okay, the climate change was the only need we had. Now we see so many needs, real needs, where we have to make decisions. And I tell you, the decisions that took years started to take months and weeks during the COVID. And the decision who, that, that took years or months and weeks during the COVID took days and hours during the war. So we are capable. We as a continent, we as a union, European Union, we are very capable of very quick decisions. When we speak integration, I think the integration works the best if it's based on unity. The same, the need now we are in is who is gonna deal our security for Europe? Who's gonna speak for Europe? First we had, okay, there is gonna be United States and Russia, Ukraine must be there and understandable. It must be Europe who will negotiate our security. And we have to have the answer, who for Europe will be the person who will be at the table as a leading, leading person for our future. Because even in the NATO, United States was guaranteeing our security. We just had this brother or partner who we knew he's spending a lot of money on it and uh, he's going to take care of us. No more. We have to take the leadership into our hands. As I said, Europe is the answer to this world because we are so complex continent with so complex history. So now, great many opportunities ahead of us for every generation, and we just have to put them uh, into, into work. That's my view. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, the Prime Minister has a very tight uh, schedule, of course, but there is time for a very few questions. And I start in the last row, and then failing. Please, a very short question. Yes, uh, it is a very short question. Okay. Thank yes. you. Um, and that is, just what is your position on China? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, maybe we can short take... Short question with a yeah. uh, short answer, right? We can take another one, yeah, over here. <laughs> excellent, excellent my, question. <laughs> my name is Günther Fehlinger. I'm the chair of the Austrian NATO committee. Mr. Prime Minister, you made an excellent speech now for NATO. Thanks a lot for that. And I would like to ask you how much, uh, what is your position towards Austrian's neutrality? Why do you think it's a bit immoral and anti-solidarity, actually, that there is not a single Austrian parliamentarian who is for NATO membership today when Finland just joined? And do you recommend Austria, Ireland, Malta to join NATO as well? And a short question about the Western Balkans, because your country still has not recognized the Republic of Kosovo. What's your superior insight in Kosovo, contrary to Austria, America, Germany? And please recognize Kosovo. Uh. Mm -hmm. Okay, there was a third hand over there. Yeah, yes, please. Yeah, yes. Jun uh, Saito, University of Vienna. And I want to have one question about uh, 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 Ukraine. So Ukraine has the aspiration to membership, uh, membership of NATO as well as uh, in, the, in the European Union. And Ukraine want to, in the short run, the bilateral or multilateral security guarantee and eventually the uh, NATO membership. And my question is, uh, is uh, Slovakia uh, ready to give the security guarantee for Ukraine in the short run and in the middle or long run? Uh, is Slovakia ready to support the membership of NATO of Ukraine? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, let's take a fourth one, yeah, just right of you. Thank you very much. Lawrence Cattle of the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy. I'm an EU security and defense expert. Um, there is no doubt that Slovakia's uh, commitment to NATO is is very strong. You have donated literally tons of military and humanitarian aid to Ukraine, but Prime Minister, 
you do still have a very serious problem with Russian disinformation in your country. I know that you said there was a shift in public support. There was indeed that. But recent studies and articles that have come out, even as soon as three weeks ago, have been showing that there is a really strong Russian disinformation presence in Slovakia. So, and I mention this, of course, because you have elections coming up in September. I mean, Euronews also did an article only two weeks ago or three weeks ago that was showing that the Russian embassy is a hub for Russian disinformation, as well as 250 pro-Kremlin publications in your country. Now, you have shut some of them down, but what is your government's strategy to further dealing with the disinformation coming from the Russian embassy and also with these publications? Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, Mr. I'll Prime start Minister. from the, from yeah. the end. Uh, yes, uh, my government or our government uh, expelled uh, 38 uh, Russian diplomats over this uh, last uh, two years, I would say. And uh, we see that uh, it still uh, didn't change the situation that much. The problem in Slovakia is that uh, the disinformation is, yes, it's sourced from Russia. If you would look at uh, the Russian embassy on Facebook, uh, Russian embassy in Bratislava on Facebook, many, many, it's floods, uh, the disinformation uh, through, the, through, the, through the realm. But the problem is that the politicians are taking the, um, the messages that the Russian propaganda is sharing. And not any kind of politicians, but the former three-time prime minister. It's the only prime minister who was three times in Slovakia, Robert Fico. He's the <coughs> loud speaker of Russian propaganda, which makes it more and more difficult. And during these five months of, uh, before the election, there's not much room that we can do uh, extensively. We're investing into developing infrastructure for conquering the disinformation, but this is an ongoing long process, so it will take several years and depends what the gov next government will be. And um, uh, the, the, there's the, the parliament is not willing anymore to take any legislation where we will be able to shut down the, the websites. We did for six months, but then the parliament said that's enough because the majority doesn't get it yet, I would say, or doesn't want to. So, so that's why the election is going to be so important. And it's a great challenge for all the democratic parties to speak about the, this priority because we don't want to go back into the times before 2020. Slovakia was flooded with corruption. I mean, we in Slovakia uh, gave freedom to the police, prosecutors and judges. And that's why so many people from the old system, old I mean, a couple of years old, but they say, yes, we were part of it. We were building a very corrupt system, and now police is taking it very seriously, which is great, and we have to move, uh, keep going. But uh, that's why some of the politicians are so... They're doing everything to get back to the power, to shut down the police, and um, it goes hand in hand with the Russian propaganda, unfortunately. So we have uh, measures long term, but it all depends what the next government will do. When we speak on uh, Ukraine and its uh, position in NATO and it goes back to uh, NATO itself and what I would say to Austria, well, we have a very clear position. Each country must decide itself whether it wants to be or not part of NATO. It's up to the citizens. We, we, we don't say Ukrainians be part of the NATO. We say it needs to be your decision. It shouldn't be Russians' decision. It shouldn't be your neighbor's decision. So I can only tell you my experience with NATO. That's what I did today. I told you what it meant for us uh, to be part of this alliance. It is a defensive alliance. It's so important. Security is number one. Yes, we felt kind of safe when Ukraine, when we had Ukraine as a uh, democratic nation between us and Russia. It changed overnight with this war in Ukraine. So that's why I, I, I think we have to think strategically and uh, I'm not going to recommend you anything. I'll just uh, say that it must be your own decisions, the citizens, it's important. And look how the, changes, how the world is changing. And, and, and if you see uh, the, the whole uh, scene, then nobody is safe. Nobody is 
have guaranteed safety. Even if you have good neighbors around you, it doesn't mean that you are totally safe. And look, uh, you ask whether we would take the guarantees for Ukraine, etc. There were guarantees for Ukraine. They've been attacked now. I mean, do we understand the treaties? The treaties were turned apart. They turned apart. Doesn't Putin doesn't care. He says you can have guarantees, whatever. Come, where are you? Those who you guaranteed. So, so that's why. I think the, our society in uh, the 21st century should, should be a century of peace. I want peace. Volodymyr Zelensky was calling for peace. And I remember it very good. Before the war, he was crying out to Putin, don't attack us. Come, let's sit down around the table. What was the response of Putin? This, is, this man doesn't want peace. He doesn't have a peace plan. So when we speak on Kosovo, the same, we have a very clear position that uh, because we respect, again, the, the, the treaties, if, there is, uh, if they're recognized, it, uh, if, uh, if uh, Serbia recognized, then we fully uh, support it. So it's, it's, again, about good neighborhood. If we respect the, the principle of good neighborhood, if we respect the agreements, uh, then everything will be long-term uh, working. If you rush it, then sooner or later, rather sooner than later, you will have another problem that was because you, 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 you rushed it. And uh, the, the last question on, on China, it's a, it's a very difficult question, yes. We definitely have to uh, take it from the right corner. We see, and that goes back for Europe. We, we really are very in a great need to say who is the representative for Europe. You saw Emmanuel Macron, traveling to China and trying, we can trust trying his best to help, but it's not as easy. And, and these kind of things usually don't make, I mean, it's not, if we would have the wisdom of what's the right decision, we would have it now. So we're looking for it. So, so that's why at the European Council, we have a lot of debates on how to approach it. And it's great, it shows that we want peace. We're willing to do the right steps. But uh, to know which ones are the right steps, it's not easy to, to know right away. So, so with China, definitely they should not support uh, Russia with any weapons, because Russia is aggressor. When we are supporting Ukraine with weapons, I and mean, we go again, about, uh, according to the international uh, treaties, because they are, they, they are the, the ones who were attacked. It's our duty, human duty, but also uh, from, from the international treaties to, to help them. But to help the aggressor with the weapons, it's total nonsense. So we have to be loud about it, and, and we have to use our diplomatic uh, strength to make sure that uh, Russia will withdraw the soldiers and the weapons from Ukraine. Because there is only one thing that must happen to have peace. Russia must withdraw its weapons and soldiers from Ukraine. There's nothing difficult about it. Just withdraw. And then, of course, repay all the, and go through uh, all the, the, the justice that it cost. Of course, the justice must be uh, present uh, for all the uh, war, war, war criminal acts. But uh, we definitely should not uh, be passive. We should be very active and look for the right solution also with China. China is an important part of this whole play. Yeah, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we will not have time to ask many more questions. I just want to thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. It really was a great evening. Uh, with your example, your, your clear stance, a rather small country in the center, but ready also to back a neighbor like Ukraine when it is in a difficult situation. Thank you very much for your stance. And we all know that this is not easy in a country uh, where there is quite a, a big Russian-minded uh, population and a, a climate that maybe also from, uh, from the problem of disinformation, uh, a situation that is not easy. Thank you so much, because you gave us 
a very valuable example. Thank you, and we wish you all the best. Before we end, uh, I want to invite you also in the name of the Austro-Slovak uh, Association and also the Embassy for some Slovak specialties uh, next room or even in this room because uh, we had to extend the whole, uh, the whole room here uh, in its largest size in, in order to be able uh, to bring all the people uh, on the seats. But there will be an opportunity uh, to do it and we will have also the chance to listen to uh, some melodies from a Slovak artist that is also working in Vienna. Mr. Prime Minister, you certainly earn a big hand. You overtook uh, the lead of the Slovak government in a situation that was absolutely not easy. And you did it in a situation where the government uh, did not even have a majority in parliament. And you are confronted with the risks of COVID, with climate change and the Ukraine situation, with energy uh, and inflation, as I said. Uh, we know how difficult this job is and we wish you all the best. We wish you all the best personally, but especially for the Slovak people, the great Slovak nation, the best for you and the whole country. Thank Big you. Hand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before, before you start, I just want to all thank you once again for a great discussion, great debate, and great audience, and great welcome. It's, it was an honor for me, and I will remember this. This is a part of our home. Thank you. Thank you.